All right, so now that we finished the whole section about bad debt, how to write it off, we learned two different methods, direct write-off, which is right here in your book. And I also taught you an off, um, core off the book kind of ordeal with the allowance method, okay? So now let's talk about batch invoicing. So the cool thing about QuickBooks is you are also able to process batch invoicing. So this is only generally for customers if they are getting the same bill, okay? Or there's something that they get the same items and you need to distribute to multiple people, okay? So for instance, right, if you're a club member, right, anybody that signs up for your, I don't know, your monthly or your your weekly subscriptions, right? That is something that you're going to be billing every single customer or, you know, a certain group of customers the same bill, okay? Now, um, with that, so for instance, we're going to go ahead and say that we have some club members, okay? And we're going to go ahead and process batch invoicing, okay? So how do we do that? For any instances that we have people who join our membership and we want to um, issue them a statement saying you got billed for the, their monthly subscription, this is what the price is, so you owe this, okay? How do we do that? Well, in this case, there's only one way you are actually able to do this, okay? Only one way. And that is by going up to um, the accountant's uh, version, I'm sorry, not version, the, um, sorry. This, you, in order for you to do this, you have to go to customers on the menu bar, okay? And right here under this list here, you should see uh, process batch invoicing. Okay, let me look for it, look for it, look for it. Should be top one. Right here, create batch invoices, okay? So only way to do it is through this way, okay? Just because you're grabbing multiple people and instead of having to uh, waste your time issuing one invoice at a time, right, you are able to just uh, be able to process the same invoice and issue them to multiple individuals, okay, at the same time. So I go ahead and click on batch invoicing. You're going to get this message. Just go ahead and bypass it right by clicking OK. So first off, when we are processing our batch invoicing, we need to set up a group of individuals that we are going to um, send or issue out these invoices to, okay? So again, if, you are, if they are a club member, right? So something that's really cool about uh, uh, us being a photography type of business right we can come up with many tiers so let's say hey subscribe to me now um for my first tier which is um you know i don't know red carpet right you got red carpet you got full access you got um uh, you know just example right backstage pass full access, whatever it is, right? You can come up with some creative ideas for some kind of membership, right? You can create tiers if you'd like. So for this group of individuals, they're just regular club members, okay? So again, um, if your company does have that, so a very common one would be a gym membership, right? And for gym memberships, they have tiers as well too, right? You can get the yearly pass, you can get the weekly pass, daily pass, or you can get a... A contract where uh, you're 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 buying into X amount of years, you can have those kind of subscriptions as well. Okay, so a good one is so. We first we got to do is we got to create our group. Okay, our billing group, and we're gonna just call these very boring club members. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and click save. So now I need to add the people who are going to be under my club members. So 
in this case, let's say, let's just go down the list. We can have Tim Fang in my club. Um, we can have Bob Mason. We can have uh, Jerry Perez. And let's do one more. Um, let's do Ron Barry, okay? These are individuals that are paying their monthly subscriptions to be part of my club member, okay? And once I've created my uh, group of uh, individuals, right, so that means every time I click on, uh, like, a new set of individuals, right, um, I'm able to either issue them a different uh, type, uh, different invoice, or so on and so forth, right? So these are the people that are under my club members that are subscribed to my monthly subscription, okay? So once I've done that, I can go ahead and click save group here um, and I can go ahead and click next. So that means these four individuals, I'm going to be subject to go ahead and create a, a group for them. So then I'm going to be billing them all the same exact invoices. All right. So I go ahead and click next. So the next thing is going to be building the main core of what I'm actually charging each and in every uh, in uh, person, right? So in this case, right, we have an item called dues, okay? There you go, membership dues, okay? And it's for uh, quantity, right? They just, let's just say they have just one. They have one membership quantity, which is $25. Now, when is the date that you're going to issue this? So you can make them all the same day. Let's say your membership renews every first of the month, okay? Or it could be due at the end of every month, right? So then it reissues and starts up again for the next following month, okay? However you want to do it. So in this case, I'm going to issue them. Maybe I'm going to issue them in the middle of the month just so then I can give them a uh, terms of 15 days to pay so then they can make it within their uh, payment period, okay? Any templates you want to use in this case, I just use the magic photography. So once everything looks good, Right, this is what my invoice is going to look on all three or four invoices. Right, they're going to get one membership due, and they're all going to start on the middle of the month. So then they can they can make their payments on time. And uh, any message that you want to put on their invoices, you could say thank you for your business once again. You can even have thank you for being a wonderful member of our photography company, I don't know, whatever you want to do, right? Make sure it's tailored to that customer. So make sure you thank them. Don't just thank them for the business. Thank them for being a part of uh, your company, right? Because they're paying a subscription to you, right? And once I've done that, I'm going to click next. So what's going to happen next is you're going to see this list here. Now, um, as you can see, everybody has different uh, different uh, terms and different things. Unfortunately, you can't change it here. You actually have to change them one by one to make it more universe or uniform. Okay, in this case, you will only the only thing that you can do with this batch invoicing is just simply creating the same invoice, but Unfortunately, any changes such as terms or, or um, any, uh, for example, the invoice number, you have to adjust that yourself. It's not something that is uh, automated for you, unfortunately. So in this case, if there's a specific invoice number that you're trying to tailor, that's what you're going to do, or if there's specific terms. So in this case, there's a whole bunch of different terms that every person has, right? Even Ron, even Jerry Perez doesn't even have any terms. So we have to designate specific terms for these individuals. So unfortunately, you can't just click and um, change them, right? But you can click to see if you're going to build them or not. That's the only thing you can do. So once you see all four of these, I'm going to go ahead and click uh, create invoices. So what happens is it's going to say, okay, here you go. Here are the ones that are marked to be printed. Okay, this one's you want to be emailed. So how do you want to issue it? Are you going to invoice them and send a mail? Or are you going to have it a digital copy, digital statement, and have it emailed to them? So that's an option you can choose too. So in this case, 
Um, before I do that, I'd like to adjust them because some of them have different terms and some of them have different um, invoices. So I clicked close. Um, okay, it's supposed to generate all the invoices in front of me. So uh, that's supposed to happen. But in this case, if it doesn't happen, then you're going to have to go through each one individually. So this right here, invoice number uh, 4520 C, obviously that's something that we created. Uh, so in this case, you would have to just do 2022-101, okay, for instance, and you have to change the term on this guy and say it's actually due in 15 days, okay, by the end of the month. All right, save. Yes. No. Okay. And then now it's just Jerry Perez, and then you have to fix Bob Mason's, okay? Oh, not double-click his name, but click on him. Find an invoice right there. Uh, 20, uh, I think it's this one, okay? And you're going to have to manually just fix them one at a time, saying 2022 dash uh, two, okay, and fix his terms here to say it is net 15. So unfortunately, that's just the bad part there is that you're just going to have to adjust everybody's invoice numbers and adjust everybody's um, terms. But at the end of the day, every single invoice that you see here, they all say the same thing. So that, that's at least one uh, part of the work that you um, can do for you. So it's supposed to generate all four invoices in front of you right after you click done. Uh, but in this case, I don't know why it didn't do that. That's okay. If it doesn't do that, just go ahead and go back to their, uh, to their, their, to their profile. Look up those individual transactions. Or you can actually look at the invoice and just go click all of them there. So if I go to transactions, right? I'd be able to see all those invoices all lined up in one. So you don't really necessarily have to go through each and every single one. So as you can see here, there you go. Now I have it here. And these are all the invoices that I have pending. Okay. And all I have to do is just adjust them here um, with the correct um, dates, uh, invoices, and with the correct terms. Okay. So that's batch invoicing. Any questions there? Yes. So if we want to give um, 13 people a discount on those batch invoices, we actually have to manually go into their invoice and give them the dis say discount. Yes, yes. You would have to adjust their terms and be able to manually give them the discount. Yes. So in the other word, uh, the discount term they already have, does not look like for the online invoices. It, it is. It, uh, it is if you saved it on their profile saying, okay, this person gets this discount, this person gets this discount, right? So that's why when you gener when we generated the invoices, it automatically saved what you put on their profile. So that's why we had to make adjustments to there. So if they have 2% discount within 10 days, they still get 2% discount if they paid for the membership within 10 days. If... If, if you allow that. Oh, okay. But in this case, I don't. I just say it's just doing 15, so I have to go back, go through their profile, make an adjustments on their terms to say, no, they can't get a discount off of membership fare because that's not fair to the other people who are paying their memberships, right? I either yeah. give them all a discount or I give them nobody a discount. So I have to adjust their terms and say, your monthly subscription payment is due in X amount of days, and I made them set all to 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had to fix them and set them all to 15. Yes, question. Thank you. Yeah, just out of curiosity here, if you're going to have a membership that goes on every month, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be easier to create a second account under their name, like with the membership, an M at the end or something, just copy and paste the information over so that you didn't have to change terms? Because otherwise, you're adjusting every month instead of being able to do it once as a member of that particular group customer and go from there. 
Yes, yeah, so uh, if, if that's the case, let's say these are your members, right? Yes, then you can go into each member's profile and set those terms so then they get that spe they get that special term. But in this case, terms is depending on whether you want to give them a discount or not. If you just choose that your entire company says no, nobody gets an advantage of a, dis of a, a discount, everybody has to pay me within 30 days, then you can just have it set that it's all going to be net 30. So then that way you don't have to adjust to anybody in that case. Uh -huh. Wouldn't it be easier, one, to give them a second customer account as a member only so that every month you could just take, you know, how, you know how you said that they I got it. have one thing different on the name? Got it, yes. If you choose to do so, I mean, but I mean, at the end of the day, that's just more work on your case because then you have to make sure that if you're billing Bob Mason... You're, you're billing him for the correct account. So that's more work for you. But that isn't a bad idea. You can do that. that, that, that that's phenomenal. If you're able to, to make that reference point, then absolutely create another account for them. And if, that way it's separate and you can have them all have the same terms and then have them all just, you know, be part of that group where they're a member. That's fine. But that's just more work because what if then Bob Mason decides to buy more stuff? You have to be very, very careful and very, very, you know, um, focused on what you're doing. Because if you accidentally, you know, put it on the wrong account, then that's on your that's on your end. Yes. Bob Mason dash M okay. would be a totally separate customer, but it can't. And so all I would have to do for my batch invoice was pull out the ones that had the batch M to them okay. because they're separate customers just in that. They don't buy anything else from that. They have their main account. It's kind of like a sub account. Okay. Now, that's an excellent, like I said, that's an excellent way to do that. But when we dive into chapter, 13, uh, chapter 14, instead of having to go through all that, you could just memorize the the transaction so you don't ever have to do that deal with that ever again. It just does the, the information for you automatically without you having to even think once. And you can do a subscription too where you can issue the same exact invoice for the next 12 months. So that's even that's even more better than what you're deciding to do here. Yeah. So then we don't have to make the adjustments after nope. the Nope, all you have to do is just issue that invoice and it will do everything for you. Yeah, so 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 I'm just showing you what the book tells you that you can do. But I'm also showing you what what boundaries that you end up coming across um for instance like that, right? Unfortunately, with batch invoices, yeah, you can send them all the same invoices, but because they're attached with specific terms, that's one of the things that you have to adjust per individual now of course we can bypass that right because what's quickbooks if it's not easier right so that's why in chapter 14 which is going to be taught at the end of um the uh five, four weeks here i'm going to teach you how to do memorized reports or memorized transactions which is going to make it so much more easier so you don't ever have to go through all that again okay mm -hmm. yes question i have one I'm, I got confused. Are you changing the terms? Yes. Of the invoices? Are the invoices terms the same, but the membership terms are different? Okay, so when I created my batch invoice, right, when we give our customers terms, basically that tells them they have a deadline. Okay? So that's what terms are. Now, every person, right, depending on your relationship with this individual, right, you get to choose which customers get to take advantage of terms. You get to choose which ones don't get terms. Now, obviously, the customers are not going to be talking to one each other and being like, why did you get a term and I didn't? They're all just customers to you, okay? They, you deal with each customer 
the basis on whatever you do with them. So if I give Bob Mason a discount, but I don't give Tim a discount, that's because I have a special relationship with Bob or something, okay? Or maybe they're such a good uh, customer, they've been loyal to me for five years, that I give him this discount. So there's reasons why we have different terms. Now, that's exactly what I'm saying is that it's not fair that when I'm issuing a membership due, why is it fair that Bob gets to take a discount, but Tim has to pay the membership in full? That's not really fair because in this case, a subscription should just be a subscription. It's not something, it's not, they're, they're not buying a product from us. They're just subscribing to our services or there our services may provide extra features. You know how like when you become a membership, right? You get extra discounts, you get extra this, extra this, right? Because you're paying into the company. Makes sense? You're getting benefits out of the company than a regular person who's not a membership. So in that kind of case, well, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, give a discount for any for, for example right apple music right anybody who subscribes to apple music or netflix for example can anybody get a discount for uh, for for being a subs subscriber to netflix would you say it's fair that this person here gets a discount because they're subscribed to netflix but they're special because I don't know for some reason that they're special but they get a discount for subscribing to netflix is that fair Go ahead. I would say yes. Why would you, why would you think that's exactly. fair? Well, you're becoming a member now. Other than just being a regular customer, if you subscribe, subscribe to the membership, you, you're at, is this an additional discount on top of the discount that these customers were getting um, as just a customer? Becoming a member, are they getting additional discounts? Yes. So that's what the terms does is it gives them an additional discount even though they're already a member. It gives them an additional discount on their membership, which isn't fair. Okay, for example, another example, right? YouTube. YouTube is free for everybody, right? But the problem is that YouTube, we all have ads because that's what we get for being a free customer, right? But if you actually pay into the YouTube Red, which is a a subscription that you have to pay every single month they don't need to pay for it. they don't need to watch those ads they get to watch their content 100 percent interrupted ad free now why is it fair that they get additional discount on top of that because they subscribe to them they already are doing they're already getting the benefit of not watching ads so why are they getting an additional discount on top of that do you understand what i mean Exactly, because they already pay. They already pay the service to to get rid of the ads, right? So that's what I mean here for a membership. That's not something that you should have an additional discount for because you're they're they're paying you for those services, right? Not the other way around. It's not like they're paying us to get a, an additional discount, right? Because they're already a member. They already get extra benefits, just like extra discounts or extra services, or it, they might be able to get um, special offers. Like, hey, because you're a member, you get an opportunity to take advantage for one whole year. Out of the whole year, you get to take, you get to take advantage of one hour of a photo session, right? Because you're an exclusive member where all the other members, they have to pay for that one hour. Make sense? So they're already getting benefits when they become a member of, of, of whatever this company does. Right? I don't know what the membership club members, I don't know what it is, but what I'm trying to say is they shouldn't be taking an additional discount on a membership. So that's why it's not fair that Tim gets to, has to pay the full $25 and Bob gets to take a discount off of his membership He's already a member. Why does he need to take another discount for being a member? I don't know if that makes any sense. But anyways, um, any other questions? I heard another hand up. Well, like from for, for business, uh, you're saying... I get what you're saying. It's, it's just not a good idea to give like an extra. Correct. Discount, but, but 
Does QuickBooks let you do that though? Yeah, that's why we get to change those terms because again, your relationship with your customers, it's it's your relationship with your customers, right? If this person's been a good customer for let's say five years versus someone who's just freshly new, why would you give someone freshly, well, op, well obviously you wanna entice them, right? You would give them a discount in the first time, but when someone's that been in using your company for X amount of years, right? They're a loyal customer. Wouldn't you feel the the needs to want to give them discounts because they're paying you, they're being a loyal customer to you. So you want to give them those discounts. So that's what terms are. And they don't apply to everybody. All right? But in this case, when it comes to a membership, right, if they're trying to pay into your membership services, they, they shouldn't be able to take an additional discount on that because they already are benefiting from buying into your package. Okay, Unless you have a limited time offer saying, hey, limited time only, membership fees are, are discounted. Then yes, of course you can discount the membership fee for that special occasion, you know? If you have those kind of way to entice so you can have, you can build your membership profile, right? Just like how the gym member, right? Sign up now and get five free months or sign up now and get and, and, and pay only half the price. They always do that for memberships, but that's because they're trying to entice you to be there. But if you're already a member, why would you take another discount on top of being a member? Is what I'm trying to understand. It's what I'm trying to get here. Okay? And that's why we have to change those terms because each each person has their own set of terms. Okay, like Ron Bear, uh, Ron Barry, right? He had um, he had only net thirty. Um, Bob Mason had two percent, ten net thirty, and then uh, Jerry Prez had none. He had no terms. Okay, that's because you set that up in your QuickBooks when you created their their uh, profile. Okay. Any other questions? So as a company, it's up to your discretion whether you want to give this person a discount. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong or illegal or you shouldn't be giving these discounts. It's whatever you feel. If you want to give Bob Mason, because he's such a loyal member, a discount on the membership, by all means, go for it. Okay? But again, um... It's just depending on what the company believes in. Should this person get a discount while this person pays full price? That's, a, that's, that's up to your company policy and whether, why? Why are you giving this customer a discount and this customer not a discount? Okay? All right. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so again, that's batch invoicing. So again, it can be very useful for you if you are trying to issue everybody a, a, a specific invoice. But like I've mentioned to uh, Marcy earlier, that there are ways that you're able to do monthly subscriptions when we dive into memorizing transactions. That will save you so much more time and that way, all you have to do is just issue um, issue them and you can set it up so then you can do monthly um, invoices if you wanted to, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the next topic here, which is going to be talking about customer statements. So, of course, if we're able to send out invoices, right, the next thing that we can talk about is that you can also send out statements. So a great example of statements is going to be a credit card statement, right? What happens when the credit card company decides to issue you a statement? It gives you a list of all the transactions that you've used through that time period, right? Your billing period, right? It also gives you information on the amount balance that is due 
um, and give you your minimum payment as well as how much interest was charged for that month. So that's exactly what a statement does. So in this case, right, we're also able to send out our statements to our customers for the same exact reasons as well. Tell them, hey, Bob, this is your activity for this time period. This is your account balance. This is the interest I charged you. This is the amount that's due. And you have X amount of days to pay it, all right? So that's exactly what we're gonna be doing today is that you can send your customers statements. So let's take a look at statements. So in this case, there's actually only a couple ways you can do statements. Unfortunately, it's not like the other transactions, right? Because you are not obligated to have statements if it does not apply, okay? Especially if you are a company that's a one-time deal only, like, for example, plumbing, right? You're not going to have a plumber come to your house every month, right? You're, it's a one-time deal, right? The, the, the guy comes, fixes whatever problem that you have, and if they come back for maybe a year later or something like that, that's an example of why they wouldn't be sending out customer statements. But for a credit card company where you're a loyal person that's you know constantly using their credit card every single month, then that is a reason for them to send you a statement because they want you to see how much you've spent, what your account balance is, and how much you owe. Okay, so that's a that's a that's an example of why a company would use a statement. So in this case, there's only a couple ways you could do it. So right here, you have it on the home page statements. Right, it's underneath the customer um, section right here statements. Okay. If you go to your home page, or sorry, if you go to your customer center, right, you do not have it in your transactions list, okay? So if you go up to the top of the menu here, you will not see statements, okay? You can insert statement charges, yes, but you're not going to be able to create your statements here. So that means that eliminates two of the ways in here, right? However, you can right click on somebody and be able to create a statement that way okay so yes you can do it through that way okay so right here create statements so that is the second way and then of course your last way is going to be up on the menu bar here under customers you can create statements here okay so there's only three ways you can create statements home page the center right click on the individual but not on the individual transactions okay and you could do it on the customer's uh, menu right here, create statements. So there's only three ways that you could do it, very limited um, ways, okay? It's because it's not a general transaction that could apply to every business, okay? So let's go ahead and just do the one on the home page and let's check out how these statements can be generated, okay? So first off, we're gonna start off with the first thing is, what are you creating this billing statement for? Okay, or in this case, yeah, the statement, right? You have to have a time frame, okay? So in this case, let's do it at the end of, uh, so since all of my, most of my transactions are in 2021, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's say March of 2021, okay? Let's do it at the end of the month. Usually statements happen at the end of the month. Now, what is the time period that you're creating this? Well, it's going to be from January, right? We're going to do quarterly statements. So I'm going to say January 1st of 2021 all the way to uh, March 30th, 1st of 2021. So giving them a three-month time period of all their activity and transactions, okay? Next thing is going to be selecting your customers. So what types of customers are you going to be issuing um, these statements for, okay? Are you gonna do it for all your customers? Or are you gonna do it for multiple customers so you can select them? Or are you gonna do it for just one customer, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna do for all my customers. You can even tailor them by customer type. So if they're, if you wanna just only send statements to your, um, residential customers, you can do that, or you could actually um, do it based on how they preferred to get sent their statements, right? 
whether it's email or um, uh, um, mail. So in this case, excuse me, I'm going to do it for all my customers, okay? Now, that's just a, that's a wide range, right? Because I have a lot of customers. Now, in this case, right, I can build conditions. So then I don't necessarily have to bother the customers that don't have any account activity, okay? Because this is strictly statements or for strictly your more active customers, right? They're meant for the customers that actually bought something from you, okay? So on the right side is where you're going to be building your conditions, your um, your section offs, okay? So which groups of individuals can you um, send a statement to versus the ones that you don't want to send them to? So first question here is going to be, are you going to create one statement per, per customer? Yes, right? You don't ever want to do um, per, per job or per, so in this case, I want to only do for one per customer, okay? And then you can also set up your template as well too. Second one's going to be show invoices, items, and details on them. Of course, you don't ever want your customer to call you back and be like, what am I getting billed for, right? You want to specify all the details so then they can understand when they read it. Oh, I bought this and this and this. So the, the items and details on it is very crucial for a statement, okay? Do I want to print statement by billing address, zip, and code? Sure. Okay. You're just printing a statement for those that um, sign up that has their addresses on them. Okay. Which is normal, right? A lot of statements nowadays, they're, they're virtual. They're um, by email now. But if you want an actual physical copy, then go ahead and print the ones that have addresses on them. Okay. Now, here's the criteria. Here's the condition. Do not create statements, okay, with customers with a zero balance. Of course, you do not want to create an invoice for people who have zero balances. So once again, don't bother people that don't need to be bothered, okay? If they haven't had any activity with you, then don't bother to send them a statement. That's a waste of paper. Okay, that's a waste of time for you to create and have the package mail and send it out. Okay, and on top of that, they're going to look at it and they're going to throw it away because they probably be like, I don't know who this company is or I've never talked to this company. So what is this? Right. They might just throw it in the trash. So again, waste of time, waste of money, waste of paper. So don't even bother them. Other ones is going to be within a, ba a balance less than. Yeah, so if, if they only owe you $25, is it necessary for you to waste money on a statement, to print out a statement when they only owe you $25? You're better to just send them an invoice at that point, okay? A reminder invoice. So, but yes, you can cap off on how much they owe you to go ahead and do that. But in this case, I'm not going to mess with that. I, I want to bill everybody that even owes me a dollar, Okay. And then with no account activity, obviously, right? Same thing with uh, with no account balance, right? That means you don't want to bother these people who haven't been active. And for inactive customers. So if you have a list of inactive customers, people that you don't talk to ever anymore, but they're just still listed in your list of customers because you're keeping it for your records in case one day you come across them, right? And you say, oh, you do have an account with me. No, you don't want to bother people that you haven't talked to in years, okay? So in that case, I don't want to create any um, statements for inactive customers, okay? So once I've filled out my criteria and everything looks good, so what I can do is before I print them or send them out emails, I can preview them. Okay, so let's take a look at what they look like, okay? So this is what it looks like, okay? Here's my first um statement for um for miss uh miranda's corner okay so here's what their activity was in january all the way to uh march right they owe me right now a thousand dollars okay let's see what the next one is okay so the next one is 
Miss Maria Cruz, right? She owes me three thousand dollars. Okay, and she had a lot of activity. Then we also have Bob Mason, who is also one of our customers who owes me only seven hundred and seventy six dollars. So this person must be buying, paying, buying, paying, buying, paying, which is exactly what we want from our customers. But we can give them a record of that. Okay. And then uh, that should be it, right? There's only three here, all right? So everything looks good. This is the template that you use, right? The Imagine Photography template. So this is what it looks like. It gives you all the information. And then at the very bottom, right, we said that we wanted um, all this information of what interest, things that we charge, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And at the top, we want the due date and the um, account balance, okay? So um, the due date's down here, sorry. Uh, and the account number amount due, okay? So that's that there, all right? So that's an overview of what the statements would look like. It's basically a list of transactions uh, or uh, activity that an individual has done, all right? Now, what if you decide that because they owe you so much money, right? And they you haven't seen a payment or them pay on time. Now, the agreement of having an account with, with you is you can assess additional charges. So for example, right? You uh, Many credit card companies assess you interest charges all the time, right? They write on their, uh, the statement, right? This is how much you owe me but this is the interest that I'm collecting or charging on top of this what you owe. So yes, you can finance or an, an, an assess, you can assess a financial charge, all right? And that's right here, you can assess a finance charge. So again, um, you're gonna see this window and it says yes, yes, you wanna set it up. So what you're gonna do when you click on this is that you're gonna set it up in your, um, preferences so then when you have future statements that this is what it should be right so here's what it says right here annual interest rate so in this case what is my annual interest rate for me allowing my customers to owe me on an account and if they make their payments on time then they make their payments but if they don't what is the amount that I can ass uh, assess a finance charge to okay I can do 10% okay 10% is actually pretty low okay if you ever own a credit card they are anywhere up to nowadays they're almost 30 percent okay but that's an annual percentage so that means every month right it's divided by 12 so in this case uh 10 percent is really not that bad okay minimum finance charge so again uh, for any reason that they don't meet that criteria, you can't just assess them a small fee, right? The minimum could be a dollar, okay? And of course, um, what is the grace period that you allow your customers to, um, to be aware of this late charge? In this case, we're going to be ruthless and say no. We don't give them any grace period, okay? And then now it's going to be finance charge account, and this is going to be considered interest income right because you're charging them money on top of what they owe so you're generating income based on an additional charge so in this case we call this interest income okay so there you go interest income and of course are you going to assess um in uh, are you going to assess assess finance charges on um overdue finance charges so that means if they if they if they had a late charge right are you going to assess an additional late charge on top of that late charge why not that's what a lot of companies do right that's what banks do right banks do this all the time if you overdraft your 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 bank account right every day that it's overdrafted you get charged an additional fee on top of a fee on top of a fee so yes yeah, sure why not okay and of course, when do you want um, the to calculate the charges from? We want it on the due date. So if it's past due, boom, they're going to get that finance charge immediately. Okay. 
Um, oh, and let's see, mark finance charges invoices to be printed. So that means when I print this, it's going to state that they got charged. Okay. Of course, you want them to know that as well. You don't want them to be like, what are these surprise fees? Okay. All right, so once I click OK, so now I'm gonna, it's going to take me to this window to actually assess the fees. So in this case, right, since we're, well, let's, the date that we're on, it's in the future. So let's actually t tone it down. Let's take it back to um, last, let's take it back to the statement due date or the statement um, date. So in this case, March 31st of last year. So now the assessments, they lower down, right? So now Mr. Uh, Ron Barry owes me $25, right? If you remember, he's gonna get a, a late fee for a dollar, okay? Maria Cruz doesn't owe me anything because she hasn't been late on her payments, okay? But her branch opening, Yes, she owes me three thousand dollars. So therefore, that's three. That's ten percent of that. So she owes me four hundred and four dollars of interest. Okay. Uh, what about Tim Fang? Again, a dollar. Okay. Um. Uh, Bob Mason owes me eight hundred dollars. So ten percent of that. Well, actually, not really. Ten percent. Um, says that it's going to be ninety-seven dollars. So again, these are late charges assessment fees okay and it's based on again when did they pay are they late etc cetera, etc cetera, okay so once i figure this out i can go ahead and say um assess charges so now that i got that beep of approval so what happens when i assess those charges it should apply on the invoice and it will show you oh what well, when you print it of course it should show you um Okay, it should show you uh, down below, okay, that you got assessed that charge. Okay, so right here, he used to owe me $776, now it is $787. So here is that financial, finance charge. So again, uh, it did take, it, the percentage it showed you was for the whole year, but I guess it did calculate it for the month or for the three months. So therefore, um, whoever this person is, I don't know who this is. Yeah, the finance charge is listed just under the last invoice on 331. Yep, yep. So for any so for any invoices that are overdue, they will assess the finance charge. So in this case, it tells you at the bottom here how much how much was that balance that they charged you, what was their current balance that they the statement was due for, and this is what their new total is. Okay, so again, it's on everybody's statement that they got charged, okay? And I can go ahead and click close. All right, so that's how you assist financial charges. So again, if you are in, if you are setting up some kind of agreement plan with your uh, customers saying that they can make monthly payments to you, that's a perfect opportunity for you to be able to assess those statement charges. Now, yes, unfortunately, you're going to have to manually do it for every statement that you release, okay? Because you have to assess those charges, meaning it's not going to happen automatically for you. You have to do it manually by clicking that assess charges and then clicking on those individuals that they should get charged and whatnot, okay? Any questions for that? Okay, it is getting close to four o'clock. So next section that we have here is going to be um, customer communications. Okay, so I'm gonna actually skip this section because again, if it applies to your business, then it applies to your business, right? If you like to have um, email subscriptions, so you know how a lot of companies to say hey sign up for my email and you and I can email you some you know um, discounts or I can email you some uh, advertisement to show you what's on sale right those if they choose to do so right you have this section called um, 
the automate auto, the automatic customer communications. So just go ahead and read this section on your own, just because it may apply to you and may not apply to your business, right? But yes, you can send mass emails to your customer for any reason that you want. Okay, you can even send mass text or um, mass letters if you wanted to, right? So in this case, this is what helps you communicate with your customers. So again, go ahead and read that on your own on how to be able to do that. You can assess payment reminders. So it's a good reason why. So again, if you ever do online paying, bill payment online, right? They always send you um, uh, a email for confirmation saying, hey, thank you for making a payment today, right? That's an automated message that is set up like this through QuickBooks, okay? Or if they send everybody who signed up to their email, right, a weekly ad, that is something that they can automate. So then you can write your message, attach the file that you need to attach, and mass send it to all the people in your um, list that has an email. So that's pretty cool about that. So go ahead and read that section on your own, okay? Last section I'm going to talk about is going to be sales tax, okay? Sales tax. How do you collect them? How do you create them? How do you pay them, right? Let's talk about all of those things because, again, they're broken off into different sections. So in this case, chapter two was how do you, how do you initiate them, right? How do you collect them? And then uh, chapter four is how do you pay them? All right, so in this case, I decided to combine all of those um, ideas into one so we can see how we're able to collect, pay, manage, and so on and so forth, okay? This section is all about sales tax. All right, so first off, let's talk about how we're able to even understand sales tax. Sales tax is a mean of it's a means of when we sell something in their store, we are subjected to have to pay into um, society for once again doing business in the state and local um, areas of our business, right? So if we're if we're doing business in Atlanta, Georgia, then therefore we're subject to Georgia's tax, and we're also subject to collecting Atlanta's ta ta tax, right? City and state. Now, what is this tax? We don't pay the tax, okay? Customers pay us for the tax, right? It's our means, right? Our duty as a business is to collect that money from our customers because that is the customer's contribution, okay? to pay into society. And all our job is to collect that money and pay the government, okay? So that's the purpose of us doing business, right? The reason why all of our items are, are, are taxed is because it's our agreement that we had with the government, with the state and local agencies that if we're gonna be doing business in this city and this state, that means our promise is that we're gonna be collecting this money from our um, individuals, our customers, and forwarding it to the government, okay? That's our responsibility. So we don't pay into the sales tax. The customers pay into it, okay? The only way that we pay our sales tax is if we go buy and purchase from other vendors, okay? So that's the purpose. That's the understanding here. So that means we are looking at a tax rate that's a combination between the state and the local county that you're doing business in, okay? So that means you have to do your research in exactly which areas you're gonna be doing business in and making sure that you follow the rules and guidelines, especially with the law, with the state and the county that you're doing business in because they have different rates, okay? For example, right, California, right? Um, I used to live somewhere in along the lines between Orange County and LA County, right? Now, if you do not know this, you walk past the street on was one street, you're in LA County. If you walk past this street, you're in Orange County. So it was really funny because when that situation happened was we, uh, I bought something not knowing I was in LA County. I got charged a higher tax. 
And what happened is I end up returning that product in LA County and walking down the street, a street over, I was in Orange County and I end up paying a lower tax rate. Why is that? It's because the counties also are contributing to those sales tax. So as a customer, depending on which county we are, do, we are buying our items at, that means we're contributing to that county. So LA County obviously is going to be LA County. So Hollywood, all of that areas, right? They're getting that money collected for all those businesses around there. While in Orange County, it's going to, you know, stretch from, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Orange County. So, you know, uh, Mission Viejo, like all that areas, right? They're all considered Orange County, Orange County itself, right? Um, Anaheim where Disneyland is, Anaheim, uh, Fullerton, all of those are going to all contribute to Orange County, and they're all going to be funded in that area. So that's what I mean is that when you have those different, even though they're in the same state, because of the county that they belong to, they start charging a separate tax because, again, tax is a combination between state and county, okay? So now that I got through that example, that's exactly why how do we collect our sales tax? Well, let's take a look. When we go into our forms, our sales forms here, right? We have this little area for whether a product is taxed or not. But if we actually go down to this form, we can set taxes, okay? We can set taxes that are from here. So this one's Contra Costa, out of state, or Santa Clara. So Contra Costa is probably Walnut Creek area, while Santa Clara is in the San Jose location, okay? So those are based on two different counties, right? You, um, again, um, this is something that we have to create, and these are called sales tax items, okay? Now, if you remember in chapter seven, when I talked about sales tax codes, sales tax codes basically tell me is this item taxable or is it, it is, is it tax exempt, okay? And there are some things like, for example, groceries, right? Food and anything that's disposable is going to be, or not disposable, anything that is uh, a grocery or that's perishable, there you go, those are going to be non-taxable, where anything that is usable, disposable, right? Anything that's for a daily use, those are going to be taxed because those are products that isn't necessary that fits the guidelines of food and groceries, right? They're things that you use. So those are going to be considered taxed. So that's why we have to create those sales tax codes so we can defer, the, de, make a difference between the um, items that are taxable and non-taxable, okay? Then the second thing we got to do is create these sales tax items to generate how much tax this product is going to get taxed at, all right? So let how do we create that? So we talked about items before, right? If I click on items and services here, this is where my Contra Costa, my out of state, and my um, Santa Clara tax is here, right? We call these sales tax items. Now, because when we're looking in a situation when we're dealing with sales tax, right, we have to consider who are the agencies that we're paying, okay? So, for example, right, I could be paying, sac I could pay, I could, I could be paying um, Las Vegas, right? That's the um, uh, Nevada. Um, okay, so Nevada, right? If I pay Nevada, right? Which agency am I going to actually be paying? Am I going to pay the city itself or am I going to pay through the government agency that is in Nevada, right? And then for the county, am I going to pay the same agency or am I going to pay the separate agency? If there are two separate different agencies, if you pay your state separate from where your county is, then you need to create what's called a sales tax group, okay? If those two, the county and state are made payments into one um, agency, then you just only need to create a simple sales tax item, okay? 
So in this case, let's just do an example right here where we do pay two different agencies, right? So let's go ahead and create our new account, okay? So if I go ahead and create a new account, you have the options to create a sales tax item or a sales tax group. Now, in order to create the group, you need to create the sales tax item. I know, weird, right? But that's how we are able to group them together. All right, so let's go start off with our first one, which is a sales tax item. And who are we gonna pay? This is gonna be called Nevada tax, okay? This is the state tax, Nevada state tax. Okay, and description, writes Nevada state tax, how much is the percentage? So right now, for the state, you we are subject to have to pay 4.6%. Now, hold up, hold up, that's not what the tax is. That's just the state section. That's just the state portion of the tax, okay? And what agency are you paying? So in this case, I believe they say um, state board of equalization okay and i click okay all right so that's just the state now let's say i need to create a second item okay so i have to create a second item okay and i'm going to call this clark county okay okay clark county clark county tax Okay, so then my description is going to be Clark County tax. Now, how much is Clark County going to be subject to be taxing um, the individuals? Well, let's see. Right now, it is 3.775 right now. Okay, that's Clark County. Now, what agency are you paying? Now, in this case, it's going to be different from the State Board of Equalization. So maybe it is the, um, the board of taxation let's just say okay just so that we can have this example exist all right i'm going to create this new uh oh i clicked uh, i just want to click at this so uh what did i say board of taxation okay quick add okay and let's say that's the agency i pay the Clark County District for, okay? So I click okay. So now I have two separate taxes. Now that means I can't charge my customers for Nevada and then charge them separately for sales for Clark County. So what do I need to do here? This is where I, since I'm making two payments to two different agencies, how do I make it so then I charge tax at one simple rate? This is where I have to create the sales tax group, right? So I created the sales tax group. What is it called? I'm going to call this, uh, I don't know, Summerlin, Summerlin tax, right? Because that's the, that's the city. Or no, Las Vegas. Let's do Las Vegas, okay? Las Vegas tax. So in this case, description is going to be Las Vegas. So what are the tax items I'm going to be having? I'm going to have Nevada state tax. And I'm gonna also have Clark County tax, okay? And here, isn't this what the tax is right now? It is right now 8.375%, so this is accurate. And this is what I mean. It's made up of two different taxes. State is one of them, and then city or county is the second one, okay? So your taxes that you're paying isn't just paying one person, it's paying two things, state and the city or county that you um, are buying the product in. All right, so once that looks good, that means when I use this item, right, it's going to make a payment to the state for the 4.6%, and then it's gonna make a payment to the county for the 3.775%, okay? And that's what you need to do when you have to pay your county and your state to two different people. Now let's say I am making a payment to just one agency. Then you could go ahead and just use that simple sales tax item and just say that tax is 8.25% or 8.375%.
right? Because you're paying only one agency. So that's the huge difference when you're creating your sales tax, okay? And I'm gonna click okay. So there you go. I have Las Vegas tax right here. So that means when I go ahead and bill my, or okay, charge my customers, right? Okay, I can have now the option to charge them for Las Vegas tax, okay? Which shows you right here that it's 8.375%, all right? So that's how we're able to collect our tax, is simply by saying this item is taxed, this is how I'm gonna collect it by charging my customers. Okay, there's one part, done, okay? All right, so what's the next step? How do I pay my sales tax? Straightforward, if you go up to this window right here where it says manage sales tax, you'd be able to do it here, okay? You're also able to do that by going up to the vendor's menu and then clicking sales tax, and you're also able to make your pay sales tax right here, pay your sales tax, okay? But in this case, I'm gonna show you this, um, ma this uh, manage sales tax. Now, when you're making a, a payment to your sales tax, never ever use the right of text window, okay? Never ever use the writer text window because that's not going to uh, have any relations to your sales tax. Now, with the newer QuickBooks, right, you do get flagged saying if you are in the writer text window, it's going to recommend you, hey, it looks like you're paying a sales tax liability. Shouldn't you be using the manage sales tax window? And you click OK and it will take you there. So they, don't, they give you some preventative measures so you don't ever use the write a text window. But that's the recommendation is don't use a write a text window because it's not going to make an association to that you're making a sales tax payment. Okay? And I'll show you what I mean. Okay? So once you get here, right, you can choose to set up your sales tax. Okay? So sales tax preferences. So this basically, if you click here, it will take you to your preferences. And you can choose... What is your most option? So this is where, are you charging sales tax? Of course you are. There's only five states that do not charge sales tax and we are definitely not one of them, okay? Um, so yes, we do charge sales tax, okay? Now, what is your often used you know, um, sales tax? So yes, you can automate this so then when it, you do charge your sales tax on your form, it's gonna be automatically assumed that you're using this one. But again, you don't wanna use this one if you don't necessarily need to, because again, we have two store locations. So that means we have to toggle between the two all the time. So you don't wanna set a preference for that one, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna leave that one alone. Other things too, okay? Now it says add sales tax items. We've already done that. We did the sales tax items already. So now it's asking you, what are your items? What code are you gonna use for taxable items? Well, we use tax. What are you gonna use for non-taxable items? Service, okay? So that's something that you just have to set up. So if you're a grocery store, you say whatever tax code you use for groceries and whatever tax code you use for um, non-perishable goods, okay? And so on and so forth. And then here, last but not least, how often are you going to make payments to your state and local government. Monthly, quarterly, or annually. Now this will depend on how much money you collect from your sale, from your uh, customers. If you're a very small business and let's say you only get a customer once a week, you can get away with paying sales tax at the end of the year. But if you're like a, something like a major corporation, okay, so in this case, you this isn't a corporate one, but if you are a major corporation where you're getting constant collecting sales tax on the daily your option might be every week okay but i think this the maximum you can do or for the minimum for that one would be monthly so you have to make your monthly payments every time so in this case if you choose monthly okay that would just give you reminders on your reminders sheet to pay so in this case after we set that up right here this is where you can pay your sales tax so i'm going to go ahead and click on pay sales tax you're gonna get this little pop-up window 
pretty much saying, okay, I'm going to pay Santa Clara and I'm going to pay Contra Costa. Okay, it's coming from my checking account and I'm going to pay today. Okay, and um, for the sales tax that I've collected for uh, the previous. Okay, and then of course, um, let's see, I can't, it won't be able to be printed. Uh, so um, to be printed, we're most likely going to be sending a check. Most cases, a lot of these things are digital now. So a lot of sales tax that you have, you have to set it up though by um, setting up the account, okay, where you can automate this using QuickBooks to make this um, the, uh, the payment through um, an EFT. But in this case, if you are not using an EFT and you're actually writing a check and mailing it out, then you're just going to have to send in the check, okay? But most cases, a lot of the sales tax, especially when we get dive into payroll, they're all automated. You have to you it's it's all through um through wiring transferring from one bank account to another. Okay, there is no such thing as sending out um checks now to the government for paying. Okay, right? Because if they can wire through your bank account, they get that money instantly. So that's the benefit of why they choose to do so. So once you've done that, I'm gonna click OK. All right, get that beep of approval, meaning saying I paid for my um, sales tax. So if I go ahead and take a look here in my checking account, it's gonna tell me I made a tax payment, okay? Different from a check, different from an EFT, different from a bill payment. You have to use the sales tax manager to be able to make your payments for sales tax. This is the only way it's going to link your account with the sales tax account and make those payments from directly from those um, sales tax accounts, okay? If you use write a checks window, you will get that error that you, you shouldn't be doing using write a checks to make a payment for your sales tax, okay? Any questions? We talked about how to set up sales tax. We talked about how to collect them. And of course, how do you collect them? You collect them by just having your sales, right? It does the work, it collects, and it puts the information in a specific account called the sales tax payable account, right? It does it for you automatically. So when you um, process your invoice that has tax on it, it's gonna make an association that, okay, you getting income, but you're also paying taxes, okay? So a portion of the money actually goes to tax. And how do I pay my tax? Right there, right? I use the um, tax manager to pay my tax, okay? Any questions in regards to sales tax? Yes. Yeah, I kind of wondered, <laughs> when you're setting up a new company, mm -hmm. now I'm going to be doing my own company. Okay. Do you set all of this up to begin with, or do you if you if you want the best outcome for your company you should set everything up ahead of time and then process your everything else afterwards okay or like do uh, do do your bookkeeping afterwards now the only one that you're not going to be setting up all the time or the, I mean the only one that you're going to be setting up as you go would be your chart of accounts because you never know when you come across an, an expense that's unexpected right you can add that all the time you're always going to be adding your customers all the time you're always going to be adding your vendors in all the time but this right here if you can set this up prior right it makes it that much more easier for you to be able to enter in all your transactions because it's already set up. But if you have to do it on the go, like I mentioned, you can do that. It's not wrong. It's definitely 100% valid because, again, if you come to a situation where, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to charge this for Las Vegas tax, then that's something that would be a first-time um, thing. But, you, you know, as you go through the... Uh, the, the motions of a business, right? You're going to be understanding how your business operates. And is this the correct way of doing it? 
you would never know unless you go through the motion. So setting up QuickBooks. So it, would be, it would be wise to put together a checklist of what I do for each company. 100%. Yes. 100%. Okay. So in Chapter 12, I, um, in the video, I did mention this. Before even initiating the company file setup, you have a step zero. That is basically your business plan. What do you do? What do you sell? What are you? What kind of business are you? If you don't have any of those basic questions, like do you start charge sales tax? Well, where's your company? Are you gonna be char are you gonna be having it in the state of Nevada? Is it gonna be Summerlin area? Right? If you don't have that basic information, then there's no point for you to create a company file because you don't have an idea of what your company is. So you need to build a business plan to map out, I am a business, I sell this, I charge sales tax, I have employees. It's, that is crucial before starting a company file or any company file is you need to have that basic information about your company. Because if not, then you're just walking in here blindly creating a company out of scratch, out of thin air, with not knowing what you do. And that's... And I guess I kind of figured I knew that for me. Mm -hmm. But you do register. I ought to do that with each customer as I get them, too. Correct. Because I would be putting their stuff into my computer. Absolutely, so. yes. And there are ways around it, too. So if you are a pre-existing company, let's say um, you migrated from Excel to... QuickBooks, then of course you can just use the company's file, the data, the, the spreadsheets, and you can copy and transfer all that information in um, through Excel too. So instead of having to plug everybody in one at a time, at least by then you should be able to set up your company exactly how it is because it's already a pre-existing. You already know what the company is about. You already know what they do. You already know what taxes to charge. So in this case, setting it up a pre-existing company is much more easier than starting from scratch. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, the ones that are being referred to me right now are the ones that have all their stuff written down in notebooks. And here you go. Would you make this something that works? <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Any other questions? in regards to sales tax or anything in chapter three. Yes. It happened to me before, and then so I'm just curious, but I bought the clothes for my kids outside in Reno. Okay. And then they had a higher tax sales tax, and it was a Target. And then when I came back to Las Vegas, I returned it because my daughter didn't want to wear it. She didn't make, she didn't like it. So I ended up returning it to the local store, which had a lower sales tax. So you got less so money they, back. And then they gave me a money back with the higher sales tax outside of Reno. So as the company said, the San Jose and Walnut Street has different sales tax. And then some customer bought at one place one store and then brought it back on the second as uh, giving them a credit. Um, since we are just keeping one track of the um, expenses, it doesn't make any differences in a sense when it comes to um, paying for the sales tax. Well, yes and no, but here, think about it. You paid more in Reno. When you could have paid less in Vegas, yeah. So that's 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 money out of your own pocket. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that? No. So, <laughs> um, but, but as a business, so um, a customer bought the expensive paper for painting, let's say, uh, pictures at home, and then they said, "Oh, we didn't need them this many packages, so I'm bringing it back," and then they they brought it back with a different store, which had a less uh, sales tax. I'm still obligated as a store to give the customer back with the higher sales tax, correct? Mm -hmm. correct? 
that's why it's important that they have a receipt proof of a transaction because yes, that is true. If they didn't have that sales receipt, and let's say that you, 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 you came to the store with no sales receipt or you didn't come with the credit card that you paid it off with, right? Yeah. They're gonna have to sub- they're just gonna have to see, okay, well, this product does exist in my store, but unfortunately I have to give you the lower sales tax because you don't have proof that you bought it in Reno. So in this case, that's one of the situations where if you don't have that receipt, then they can't tell you that this is the money that you paid originally. They don't have record of it. They're not going to call the other target and tell them, I need to you to look up this transaction number because how many billions of people went to that target, that same exact target? That'd be near impossible. So in that case, that's, that would be a situation, yes, if you have proved the receipt that you paid a higher tax, then of course, that company is obligated to pay you, especially Target, right? Yeah. You don't even have to buy the product out there, and if you come and return it, they'll give you their money back regardless whether you bought that from that store or not because yeah. they pride on customer satisfaction. Yeah. So it doesn't even matter whether you paid more or not in that kind of case because their goal is customer satisfaction. Okay. Okay? So it really depends on your company as well, but let's say you did have that instance where um, you you charge higher for San Jose, but you charge less in Walnut Creek, and someone yeah. decided to do that, right? You can't technically give their money back, especially when it's taxed, right? Yeah. So if they want a refund, then yes, you can issue them the whole refund, and then they can repurchase it for a lower price. That's okay. another way that you think you can do that as well, too. But for that kind of difference there, um, no. You can't do it unless um, specifically if it's a company policy, okay? okay? So it really depends on your company, all right? Every company is different, especially corporations, right? But if you're, like, a really small business, you can't really let that go for uh, just to keep the customer happy because they are one customer out of a billion, so, yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right, last section here is just sales reports. So like I mentioned before, if it's pertinent to you and your position, then that's going to be useful for you. So as I've mentioned before, if you've done your reading, right, and you went over all these reports, it's pretty straightforward. If you go to reports at the top of the window and you click on sales, we'll give you a drop down list of what reports you can do with sales. So again, you could see sales by items list, sales by customer, okay? You can even sales by rep, okay? Sales by ship to, you could do them in sales graph. You can do a lot of these different types of um, sales reports, okay? So again, they're only pertinent to you if you have a question in regards to your, uh, uh, is in regards to the sales section of this business. So again, you could do your reading on that, okay? And all right, so let's go ahead and go over the review questions, okay? So the multiple choice, all right? Multiple choice, let's go ahead and number one. Okay, so your job is to select the best answers, okay, for each of the following, okay? So number one, okay, customer statements. So what do they do? A. A, right? They provide a summary of all accounts um, activities, right, okay, um, for a customer during a specific period of time. Okay, great. Number two, which of the following options is not available on the available credits window? D. D is correct, right? Use the receive payments. Yes, oftentimes when you do a credit, you can never use it as a means to pay for the items that you purchased, right? It's a, That's a company policy that everybody knows, right? 
You definitely can only refund the individual. You can either apply it to their invoice, but you cannot use it to make a payment for something. Okay. All right. Next, number three. Okay. Um, okay. Delete the original invoice. Okay. So in this one is a weird question. So try your best to kind of answer this one. Delete the invoice. De delete the original invoice. The only one that fits completely is A. Let's see. A. Okay. Okay. When creating a credit memo, use the bad debt item. Okay, and apply the uh, credit to the past due invoice. So is that why you would delete an original invoice? It doesn't I, that delete it on the book, so to speak, though? It doesn't delete it. What it does is when you apply it to the invoice, it counts it on that invoice saying, and it marks it that it's been paid. So it doesn't delete okay. it. Be, be paying the available. Cur uh, yeah, no, that's that wouldn't be the option either, right? When you So A says... If you do apply the credit memo to the invoice, it doesn't delete the original invoice. It just it B. You say B. Yes. B. When you create a credit memo for um, the amount of the past due invoice and then retain as an available credit. Yeah. They. In this case, the book does say it is B. Um. Uh, do you keep everything in the record? Correct, correct. You yeah. should. That's a definitely one number one rule of accounting is never delete anything. So in this case, um, but if you do retain it as an available credit, then that pretty much makes the original invoice cease to exist, right? Right. Um, and of course, not any of the above because if A is not the correct answer, then it wouldn't be any of the above. Then it would be A, any of the above. Okay, so that one's a weird question just because I feel like this statement is not complete. It doesn't ask you whether it is to delete or what causes it to delete. So in this case, I would throw question three out. But I mean, um, try to figure what the question is really asking. So in this case, B would be the correct answer to question number three. Okay, number four. Okay. Which of the following situations would you create a credit memo? D. A D. D. Any of the above. Yes, you would create it if you need to record a cancellation, right? If you go to the if you go to the first page uh, for chapter three, it tells you right there the list of why you would issue a credit memo. Okay. B. If a customer returns merchandise, obviously. And then see if a customer requests for a refund. Yes. These are all three reasons why you would create a credit memo, okay? Another one, too, is to write off bad debt. So make sure you keep that in mind. Okay. Number five, the credit memo number should be... D. D as in David or dog is correct. Should be the same number as the invoice with... Um, which the credit memo is linked to followed by a letter C. Now again, it is subjective to you if you want to use C for credit, okay? It makes sense to use C, but if you have another type of form of um, way to separate your credits versus your refunds and versus your um, bad debt, by all means, go for it. As long as you make an association that it is linked to this um, invoice, then yes, okay? You don't have to use letter C, but as long as you make uh, a linkage between it by matching the two um, invoice numbers, then that should be just fine, okay? Number six, yes. So for question number five, you said it's preference of either D or D? No, it is letter D as in D. David, or D as in dog. Okay. Because, let's see, letter B, the next number after the invoice number. So, no, 
you can't use another invoice number if you're making a credit memo that is specified to that particular invoice, right? A credit memo stems from an invoice, right? It doesn't, it doesn't create a new invoice, okay. right? So B is not the answer for sure. Thank you. Number six, okay? You need to issue a uh, refund to a customer, okay? And the customer originally paid with a Visa card. How do you issue the credit? D. D as in dog for number six is correct, right? You're going to pay the uh, refund um, through the customer's credit card because usually for credit card payments, it, it's usually refunded to their card. There's no ways around it. Even if you, if a customer just asks you for cash back, the only thing that you can do for that situation is request that money to be on a store credit, saying that you're willing to accept that you don't want it back on your credit card, but you want to use that to buy something else in the store. Then that's for sure they're going to validate that. But in this case, they cannot give you cash for it. They cannot write you a check for it. It's just automatically going to have to go back to your credit card. Okay. All right, number seven. Okay, your company policy. Okay, is that each um, finance charges should be at least five dollars. Okay, where um, is the best place? Okay, to set. This value in Clickbook. Number seven. Someone said A, someone said B. Okay, let's take a look. Letter A. Okay, you're gonna enter the value in um, at least five dollars in the finance charges fields in the assess finance charges uh, window. Or B, you enter the $5 in the minimum uh, finance charge field in the finance charge company preferences. Let's take a look at that, okay? So if I need to assess a finance charge, right? Let's say I'm gonna do a statement and I click on assess finance charges. Now, when I click on this here, now, can I enter in the $5 payment here? Oh. You generally shouldn't because if you're charging everybody $5, the best way you should do that is through the company preferences. Yeah, if you go to the company preferences and you go under um, statement charges, so statement finance charges, right? Go to company preferences and here, you have the minimum finance charges to be the $5, right? This would be the best place to put it here because that way you don't have to manually put in everybody's account that they got $5 charge, right? Because it also depends on their account balance too. If they owe more money, then they're not gonna be charged $5, they're gonna be charged for way, way more. So if you wanna be able to assess that and make it do it automatically, best place is to do it through the company preferences. Okay. I keep forgetting that the preferences come up all over the place in the position beginning. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course. So, again, so that's why um, when you look at the company preferences, right, all of these topics right here is going to be what we're going to talk about throughout the rest of these chapters. Yeah. Okay? All right, back to this. So, question, so the answer is B in the company preferences. Okay? You can do it through A, but just remember, you're going to have to manually push in $5 per person on that list. So that is not the best place. Okay. Number eight, okay. Which report would you run to see a summary of the income by products and services? So basically... Okay, so we got B, we got D. Okay, let's take a look. So A says the sales by item summary report. Okay, that one just pretty much gives you sales based on the items that you produce. B says the sales by customer summary, right? That just basically lists out all the customers that buy, that you sold to. 
C says the customer's open balance report. This gives them basically a report on who you sold this to and what products that you sold to them. So in this case, um, C would be the best option here because you want to see you want to see the income by products and services. So the best one that you could do is going to be the customer open balance uh, report because that one's going to give you an overview of who you sold it to, what products you, and services you sold to them, and what they owe you. So, okay, so why wouldn't revenue, which is equated with income, by item? Okay, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. This is number eight, right? Yeah. So for this one, okay. <laughs> when, uh, which report would you... um? Would you see the summary of income based on products and service? Okay, so that's, sorry, sorry, I, I, I lied. It is A. <laughs> a is going to be basically doing a sales report based on items because what you're doing here is you're seeing how much money you generated from sales based on the products and services that you sold, which is your items. Okay, I still don't agree because revenue equals income, not sales. Sales and revenue by item would tell you how much income came in by each item. Okay, so in this case, right, is there such thing as a a revenue by item summary report? I don't know. <laughs> and that's that's where that's where we're gonna we're gonna prove you wrong that that unfortunately does not exist. Okay, so if I go to my reports, right, the only section I have for that is sales. And then if we go to customers and receivables, there's nothing in here in regards to revenue. So unfortunately, when you are a business, your main core of operations is sales for revenue. Okay. Okay, so if there's nothing that shows you income until you get into your financial state. That's true too, but if you're looking at profit, profit and loss, that's that's not what the question was asking. No, I know. I just assumed. I thought, you know, that there would be something that showed you that, but I wasn't thinking that they would do that just general for profit and loss instead. They they do. That's not until we uh, move into chapter six. All right. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it is a sales. Right, that's the generated income that you get to see because the main core of operations of a business is you generate revenue slash income through sales. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So in this case, it is a sales report by item. So A is the correct answer. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, number nine. Which of the following is a way to issue a credit? This is letter C, yes, okay? Um, so, yes, you're going to be creating a credit memo, okay? So, make sure you are very specific. Credit memos are what you issue credits to your customers, okay? Number nine, okay? Which type of business would most likely use batch invoicing? Letter A, yes. Anybody that's a gym or a club membership, right, they always have club membership fees that are done every month or on a weekly basis. I don't know. Okay, but that's the correct one, right, because a home builder wouldn't necessarily be batching, batch invoicing, right? Who are their customers? It's not like they build um, homes for particular people, right? They build homes to sell to people. So in this case, that wouldn't even be in that. Um, letter C is going to be account and tax businesses. Um, in some cases, accounting and tax businesses, yes. If they are, uh, let's say, um, example, right? This doesn't, this doesn't really happen, right? Let's say H&R Block, right? They say, oh... But if you upgrade to using this, oh, here's a better one, TurboTax, 
right? You, everybody can pay free for TurboTax, right? Everybody can use it for free. But they also have an incentive saying, hey, if you pay this, right, you can look, you can have a professional tax accountant look into more depth into your, your resources and they can find you ways that they can save you money on taxes. That would be a perfect example of a tax accounting type of business who could take advantage of batch invoicing because whoever pays into it, right, they get billed that same amount every time, right? So that's why the more better type, the one that you would normally definitely see would definitely be a gym membership. But that doesn't mean a tax accountant or accounting tax business don't does, does not offer that. I just gave you an example, TurboTax. Okay. And again, a retail store, that really depends, right? If you are a, a card holder, well, actually, no, because card holders, um, they don't get benefits or anything like that, unless they are like, you know, a rewards card, even they don't have to pay, it's free, then that could be um, a company that could do that, but most cases, the more obvious answer would be a gym membership. Number 11, okay, a past due invoice contains items that were taxed, okay, and of course, items that were not taxed, okay. How would you um, write off the invoice as a bad debt? So I showed you an example. Let's see. For number 11, C is correct, right? You would have to create a um, a credit memo, okay, with two bad debt items, okay, one for the non-taxable and one for the taxable item, okay, so it, it calculates the tax for you to write off the proper tax, so when you do get charged, or when you do apply that to the invoice, it subtracts the tax away from the invoice, okay, number 12, okay, which statement is true, D as in dog is correct. You can create a statement for a single customer. Yes, right? If you remember the option that you would choose, you could either choose all your customers, multiple customers, or one single customer. So that is very true. Um, I'm not going to go over the rest of the answers because they're false. Okay. Number 13, okay? After issuing a refund check, a. number 13A is correct. The credit memo is marked as um, a refunded and the um, remaining credit field is zeroed out. Yes. Okay. Well, that depends if they're, if, for example, if they, if they owe you on that account and you apply, let's say, they only refunded half the stuff then of course this wouldn't be true. But in this case, they're just saying if you if you gave them a full refund, then yes, their invoice should be marked to zero. If they end up returning all the products. Okay. Number 14, okay, which of the following is true? C. C is correct, okay. Credit memos look similar two invoices but perform the opposite functions yes right so this is only if you if you transfer the information from the invoice to the credit memo right but if let's say you issue a credit memo without going through the invoice then no it's definitely not similar because you would have to manually enter in everything at the same time that's why the recommended way to do it is to look up the invoice or look at the sales receipt and issue the refund directly at the top of the window um, when you click on that refunds credit, okay? Because then it's going to transfer all the information over from the invoice to the credit memo, so it makes it easier for you to kind of manage your uh, refund, okay? And that's why the invoice and the credit memo would look similar, okay? All right, now last question of the day, question number 15. In which of the following situations would you create a customer group? 
Number 15 is D. Good. Any of the above. So let's go over it. So A, if you want to um, send statements to customers with opened invoices, yes, you can create a group for that, right? Um, B, you want to send um, notifications by email. Yes, you can send a group of that, right? Only the customers that that's that gave you email addresses or sign up for your um, mailing address right or their uh, email address right then yes you can create a group that says they want to be emailed yes and of course see um, if you want to um, take action for vendor based on um, whether they apply uh, to specific uh, criterias um, Yes, yeah, so in this case, if they have something special uh, about them that you want to group uh, that particular group, go for it, right? So whether they're club members, create a group for them. Whether they um, want to be contacted by telephone, create a group for them, okay? You can create a group for any reasons if they have some kind of specific criteria. That's what C says there, okay? All right. Okay, so that concludes today's lesson for chapter three on more additional um, customer in for uh, uh, customer transactions.